Hi, welcome once again to Wikibon's weekly research meeting from the Cube's Palo Alto Studios. I'm Peter Burris, and we're being joined, as always, from by Wikibon's uh, team of analysts, including George Gilbert here in the studio with me. And on the phone, we have David Floyer, Neil Radin, and James Kabilis. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the lessons that we learned in 2008 or 2017. Uh, over the course of the next month, Wikibon's going to put a fair amount of research into making our annual predictions, and this is the first step. What lessons did we learn? What is working? What isn't working? Uh, as a consequence of some of the things that were tried, predictions that were made, and uh, initiatives that haven't necessarily panned out. Now, the reason we want to do this is not just to talk about technology, but we're trying to bring the idea to those users out there who are in the midst of budgeting about where they should continue to place bets and where they might want to start thinking about ratcheting down things that don't seem to be panning out. So there's a lot of ground to cover, and let's get started. And I want to I want to start with you, David Floyer. So the first thing I think we've learned in 2017 is that the cloud is not going to be homogenous. Do you agree? Absolutely. It's becoming very, very heterogeneous. Um, we uh, brought uh, into play the, the concept of true private cloud, and we're seeing that develop very strongly, uh, and we're predicting that again in the future will develop. Uh, service on a completely different way of doing storage. Uh, that's coming from the cloud, from the hypervisor cloud into uh, the private clouds and in general per into general purpose. And uh, we're seeing really some very uh, big changes in how systems are going to be developed. So with that as a basis for some of the kind of macro trends, the idea that business is not going to move to the cloud, as we like to say, the cloud's going to move to business. There are a number of applications that are driving some of these changes. Uh, Neil, I want to start with you. Uh, one of them is big data, or perhaps we should finally start calling it analytics. Uh, what is it about analytics that is starting to catalyze a rethinking of the overall architecture that we're going to use to sustain some of these digital business changes that all companies, all institutions face? I don't know how it started, Peter. Uh, people have been doing analytics for decades while corporate IT was more or less obsessed with operations. Uh, but over the last five to 10 years, analytics has just become the most important thing. Well, it's on a flip-flop. Uh, the problem is the approach to analytics has jumped from one thing to another so quickly, I don't think that anyone has had a chance to really perfect their approach. We went from predictive analytics, uh, and then we went to uh, data science and, and big data, and now everything is machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, if I were inside an organization right now, I, you know, my head would be spinning. Um, so we have to, I, we have to elucidate some, some clear directions for people about what works and what doesn't and what the level of effort and the, and the spend is to get things done. So George Gilbert, is it, face, is, George it, Gilbert. is it safe to say, is it face to say, is it safe to say at this point that the kind of general purpose notion of big data where you throw everything into a single store like a data lake and then you have everybody run around and looking for data, is that starting to break down and become increasingly specialized? Is that kind of what we learned in 2017? I think it's safe to say that um, big data never really crossed the chasm. Um, it was its closest uh, application to something that would be appealing to mainstream customers was taking e ETL and offloading it from very expensive data warehouses, but the the way uh, the open source ecosystem, uh, principally with the Hadoop distributions that curated all these open source components, the way it tried to attack that problem um, was so complicated in terms of administrative uh, demands that m most customers choked on it. So we're seeing increasing specialization in part because of the nature of the problems that people are trying to solve, but also the complexity of uh, the underlying solutions. So that leads to a third question. Uh, and the third question is, we talked about cloud not being homogenous, we talked about big data becoming more specialized and solution-oriented, outcome-oriented. 
One of the other big drivers in all this, David Foyer, is IoT. We'll talk in a second about how IoT and analytics are going to come together. But what are we learning from IoT in 2017? Well, what we're learning is that the edge is, again, not homogenous. And uh, it's much better to look at the uh, break up the edge and break up IoT at the edge into a primary layer uh, uh, and, a, and a secondary layer. The primary layer is a layer that is a solution which takes the sensors, takes equipment, uh, takes uh, uh, I, uh, uh, AI technologies, and bring them all together as a solution to a business problem. And uh, we believe that that is uh, a much lower cost and volume approach to the problem than everybody, every IT making their own uh, equipment in their own, uh, in their own factories or entrances. So the, the primary is the where most of the data is going to be generated and also where most of the gen data is going to be compressed down from, you know, maybe as much as a million to one to into the secondary layer. Uh, and that's the interface between the primary layer and the cloud uh, computing, whether it be uh, true private cloud or public cloud or any combination of those. Um, that that's the tertiary layer, and the secondary layer will be that interface at the edge between the uh, the primary devices and uh, the cloud computing uh, that the rest of the enterprise is dependent upon. So, Jim Kabilis, we've got three lessons learned on the table. Cloud's not homogenous, analytics are increasingly going to be a feature of applications, uh, but that's going to require a degree of retooling. IoT is not going to be homogenous, it's going to drive new data sources and new opportunities to create value in bespoke ways. Where are the developers in all this? What do we learn or what are we learning as the, de as the developer committee starts to try to participate more in the process of creating new levels of digitally based value in business? Right, what we're going to need to, what developers are learning uh, and, and enterprises are learning is that their current group of core developers are not prepared for the, this AI at the edge revolution. Not prepared in terms of skills, the tools at their disposal, the DevOps pipeline or workflows that are in place, the teaming arrangements and collaboration, those data lakes themselves. Not prepared to do AI effectively or to drive it effectively to the edge where it can achieve the intended uh, 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 you know, results in terms of business, business value. So what that means is in 2018 and beyond, if you're an enterprise IT manager or you're an analytics manager, where do you place your budget? Is it skills upgrade? Do you hire the right people? Do you upgrade your tools? Do you somehow make do with the uh, DevOps tools you have right now and bring more of the, like, you know, for example, uh, model governance over, you know, algorithms and deep learning and machine learning models into the core, um, you know, governance structure you, you have? Um, your, your data lake, uh, do you have data lakes that can, that are architected to handle machine data in great volumes? Like, petabytes and exabytes of machine data generated by all these endpoints. Okay, there's all these decisions that need to be made and there's money that needs to be spent to invest in, in, in this entire development infrastructure ecosystem to really prepare yourself to, to, for, to build these disruptive applications uh, that might take your industry by storm. And this, none of this comes cheap. So it seems guys like we're, at a situ we're in a situation where the technology in many respects is available to undertake and build and deploy and generate value out of some of these new classes of applications, but skills are very, very unevenly distributed. Uh, Neil Raden, let's talk a little bit about that. What, what is the core skills challenge that businesses face today as they attempt to explore new ways of solving problems with digitally related technologies? I think that um, the, uh, the software vendors are going to provide uh, a tiered capability, just like we've seen in other kinds of analytical tools where you have 
um, a small number of people at the top of the tier who have the background and the skill to understand whether this model was an appropriate model or whether we found correlation that was spurious because they were all time series uh, or something like that. And then you have a, a larger group of people who use these tools to drop a machine learning algorithm or uh, like a company like Data Robot, where uh, it just runs 10, 12 different algorithms that it helps you find the best one and so forth. But that doesn't mean that it's correct, and that doesn't mean that those people understand the, the statistics that are generated by the model. That requires governance of the people at the top of that tier. And then, of course, there's the lower tier, which is how do you communicate to these people what you've done with these techniques. So this is a broad problem, it sounds like. It sounds like we've got... Uh, a skills deficit problem that's going to have far-reaching impacts. We'll talk more about this during the predictions, but I think there's a one that's on everybody's mind right now. Are we going to see specialist software and solution vendors emerge out of this to, so to start the process of at least solving some of these problems and showing the industry how to go about it? Or is this something that all large enterprises and mid-sized enterprises are going to have to do on their own, and they got to start throwing an enormous amount of money at these issues? David Floyer, give our CIOs a, uh, a kind of a vision of where they should be thinking right now about how to address the challenges of skills. Well, the, uh, the, the, the big decision to make for enterprise, uh, for most enterprises, is whether to the degree to which they should invest in their own solutions, uh, their own AI solutions, or should they wait uh, until those solutions are included in ISV packages, in general purpose packages, uh, in packages they get from uh, SaaS vendors or, 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 or whatever. And uh, if you're a very large or, uh, enterprise and you can see a clear business differentiation, then clearly that investment can be justified. But I think for many enterprise CIOs, they will sit back and wait and, uh, and see the degree to which they need to invest. That doesn't mean to say that they shouldn't be uh, see, uh, actively seeing what is available in the marketplace, but it, it, they should be probably spending more time reaching out to potential vendors with a solution who can generate volume rather than trying to create snowflakes on their own. So, so uh, before we get to the action item round, Jim, I want to build on that very quickly. Uh, so Dave's arguing essentially that it's we're moving into a buy versus build as we go through this transformation. I think we all agree that's where we are today. Right. Next question though, is it going to be buying software or is it going to be buying services or some combination of the two? What did we learn in 2017 about how the availability of increasingly advanced services, especially in the AI realm, realm from some of the big cloud suppliers, is changing or altering the way businesses think about how they're going to generate value out of these technologies? Yeah, I think right now what we're seeing is the swing is toward buying services, buying cloud services that have machine learning, deep learning, AI, baked in from you know, the usual suspects, AWS, Microsoft, uh, to a lesser extent, Google and IBM and so forth. Um, what we see right now in the whole developer wars to, to win the hearts and minds of, of AI developers is it's, is it's coming down to whose cloud are you going to put your data in? You, you can do your training, model training and development and deployment. Whose framework, AWS's MXNet, Microsoft CNTK, whatever, Google's TensorFlow, are you going to use and then those vendors, the solution providers in those frameworks provide pre-trained models and all the, you know, the, a lot of other uh, capabilities to build out not only the models, but to provide a core DevOps pipeline for the data scientists who have to be standardized on one solution provider's environment or another. So George, George, uh, hey Jim, Jim, let me bring George in. George, what do you have to say about? Uh, I think we've uh, we've seen this we've seen this movie before when uh, enterprises started to build out their um, applications. At one point they were thinking of large enterprises, custom data modeling how their entire enterprise worked and 
realized they didn't have the skills to do that. They bought packaged apps. So I don't think the choice is binary between buying uh, services or buying apps. I think there's also, um, are we going to wait for the install base of apps um, uh, the, the big vendors who've, who've installed the, the large horizontal apps to add uh, machine learning capabilities to those applications? Will we start to surround those legacy apps with uh, more niche uh, package solutions? Um, and then the third one is, will we see uh, vendors like IBM um, and, and maybe Accenture, um, which have a mix of services and some repeatable IP? Great, so the one I'll add to this before we do the action item, guys, is I think one of the more important things that we're facing in the industry right now is, as it becomes evident, per David's earlier point, that the cloud's not going to be homogenous, are we moving into another round of platform wars, uh, where users have to be very, very smart about what platform they choose, yes, but increasingly, having the options to do the appropriate level of integration across whatever arrangement of cloud services, on-premise, true private cloud, et cetera, probably something, uh, a lesson that we've learned and one that our clients are increasingly tell us they have to focus on. Okay, action item round, guys. David Floyer, I want to talk with you. David Floyer, action item. Uh, the action item for me uh, is actually in infrastructure. There is a tremendous opportunity uh, evolving to develop, be able to put applications with far more data onto the systems, and those are based on a change in architecture, which we're calling Unigrid, which is stripping away the, the storage and the networking completely from the uh, processes and being able to assemble systems which do things which are just were unimaginable just five years ago. George Gilbert, action item. I go back to picking how you're going to divide your efforts among extending your existing package apps with uh, uh, machine learning capabilities um, and finding where the highest ROI areas for those are. Look at uh, the emerging uh, sort of, I, w I don't want to say startups, but younger companies that are adding these complementary capabilities. And okay, good. Next, Jim Kabilis, action item. Yeah, well, action item is explore the new generation of high level development abstraction frameworks for AI and deep learning, like the new Gluon framework that Microsoft and AWS released a couple of weeks ago. That will enable the rest of us developers to be able to do deep learning and AI development using code and visual paradigms that they've grown to love and use in their core development initiatives. Neil Raden, action item. Uh, I, li I like machine learning even though it has a lofty title that maybe it doesn't deserve. It's not that complicated, uh, but more importantly, um, it, it creates opportunities for organizations to do things that really can help them. Uh, I think we spend too much I'm talking about AI, and I think the average organization needs a, uh, a computer that thinks like a human being uh, about as much as we need airplanes to flap their wings. Uh, there's, there's just too much time uh, on AI, which is a very esoteric area. Um, you know, facial recognition and, and all that other stuff. That's going to be packaged with things if you need it, but some companies don't need to worry about finding people who can develop that. No need to anthropomorphize what does need to be anthropomorphized. Okay, so here's our, here's our overall action item. Uh, in 2017, or 2017 has been a year of significant success in the computing industry as businesses increasingly woke up to the idea that the transformation of digital business is not just about taking cost out of IT, it's about doing things differently and specifically doing more with data. We've seen a lot of leaders in this realm uh, companies that have been called digital natives have paved the way, but a lot of other industries are now recognizing that the role of data as an asset is crucial to their future, and they want to find ways of appropriating that. In particular, we think that there are three lessons that have been learned at the technology level. Lesson number one, the cloud is not going to be homogenous. The cloud is going to be a combination of technologies, each optimized to handle data as it 
pertains to particular uses, application forms, and workloads in the natural and appropriate way. Data will drive workload, will drive cloud implementation. Number two is that one of the key issues or one of the key areas of that change is the transformation from big data concepts to analytic practicalities. We've got years of working with analytics, the technology is improving, the hardware is improving, and now we can apply it in new and interesting ways. And very importantly, that includes applying it to existing legacy applications to extend their useful life as well. A lot of, is going to go on into this, but it, the uh, good news ultimately is the technology is becoming increasingly usable and increasingly useful to business. Third, the IoT or Internet of Things is going to have an enormous consequence in how we consider the arrangement of IT assets, IT investments, and IT personnel. And our expectation ultimately is that that will continue to be a crucial determinant of the decisions that ultimately get made if success is a criteria, because our observation is, yes, software is going to eat the world, but it's going to eat it at the edge. The last point that we want to make here ultimately is that a lot of IT organizations have to fess up to the reality that they're not skilled to do a lot of these things. They're not skilled to fully support the business's needs in these transformations. We are no longer in control of the speed of transformation in our industries. That's being set by our competitors who may be better or worse than us at introducing some of these new technologies and taking advantage of them and introducing new business model and customer experience capabilities. As a consequence, there's going to be a new round of value being created by solution providers utilizing different cloud options, different IoT options, and different AI options in response to expertise about how those solutions need to be deployed. And IT has to accept that sooner rather than later and start the process of establishing the frameworks for strategic management of those suppliers so they can appropriately weave them into the business in ways that serve the business's long-term needs. It's going to be a buy versus build world for the next few years and significant emphasis on buying services which will have dramatic changes or dramatic consequences for the types of partnerships that we put in place. Once again, this has been the Wikibon Research Meeting. I want to thank everybody on the analyst team for participating. Uh, we're far flung this week. We're all over the place. We're in a lot, we're in a lot of different conversations or a lot of different conferences. So thanks everybody for participating. And we hope to see you next week uh, from uh, or here at the Wikibon week Weekly Research Meeting from our from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto, California.